All right, fabulous. Uh, again, thank you for joining me. We are here to look at Canvas as an intro session. Uh, important to find the caveat of intro here. Um, <clears throat> a very massive tool and uh, lots of things that you could do in there, but we're just gonna kind of brush the surface here today. Um, we do have another session coming up um, in about two weeks, which is uh, Canvas Plus. And we'll dive a little bit further into some of the tools that um, we see faculty using a little bit more frequently on campus and some of our things that we might have a couple more questions on than others. Um, so if uh, this is good, then great, um, learn from here, and then uh, we can always attend plus um, again. Uh, next week is intro to Canvas as well. That'll be similar to this session. Obviously, the conversations might be a little bit different depending on who's attending, but as far as content and what I'm presenting, um, those sessions will be similar. So you're welcome to attend the one next week as well, but kind of double dip on this one, uh, trying to touch everybody's schedules there. All right. Um, so like I said, we're here to look at Canvas, kind of scratch the surface. I want to caveat this um, because I'll say it multiple times today that the LMS, the learning management system that we're using, which is Canvas, right, is the uh, most widely adapted learning management system in the United States, really in North America. So, um, you know, when it comes to finding something you can or having a question that you need some discovery for, you and 5 million other people had that same question. Okay, so Google here is definitely your friend. Okay, there are videos, tutorials about anything and everything you could ever want. A lot of that stuff is Canvas made. Some of that stuff is instructor made from other universities. And you'll find that even when you're Googling, you know, you'll get the Canvas results kind of at the top of your Google search, but then you'll see a whole bunch of university products that are kind of out there that's just kind of public domain. So you'll see stuff from University of Michigan, you'll see stuff from Nebraska, you'll see stuff from Maryland, right? All these very large universities um, that are using this system as well. So there's a lot of good materials out there. Um, we do have uh, some in-house materials as well, but I tend to try and not recreate what's already out there. So some of the things, you know, as far as you know, how to create a discussion board or how to reply to a student or how to set up your notifications, right? All of those resources already exist out there. So there isn't necessarily a wider resource for those things, okay? Um, obviously, anything and everything that we talk about today here and any resource I go to can always be found uh, on our instructional technology page inside of our School of Nursing. Um, that's referenced inside of our tech talk, it's referenced inside of our SON page. Every email I send out to usually has a link to that space. Um, so again, that's always a great place to visit. And of course, outside of our conversation today or anything that I go over, or anything that you're working on with your colleagues, if you have any other questions, you're welcome to reach out to me, right? So here we are in a cooperative session, looking at these things and kind of getting an intro to this system. Um, but know that you know, I'm here to work with you one-on-one -on, -one on a specific tool or a specific question or a specific content area or whatever, you know, you might need, right? I'm here to fulfill that need for you, all right? So just let me know those things. So um, let's dive in, okay? Um, again, here, intro to Canvas. I want to uh, start by saying, obviously, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. I'll do my best to monitor in there. Um, you are also welcome to unmute yourself. We only have eight people in here today, so you're welcome to talk freely and uh, pose your question. Um, chances are, if you have the question, someone else also has the question as well, especially being new faculty members or new stakeholders here on campus. And thankfully, we do have uh, Donna here for you know a little bit of an expert insight when it comes to some of those things as well, because she's been using the system um, for a couple of years now. So it's important to know that Canvas came to uh, Widener just three years ago, right? So before that, we were using a product called Campus Cruiser, which was an in-house product. When you have had a Campus Cruiser question, you could not Google Campus Cruiser. There was nowhere to find answers. So that was one of the main reasons to kind of migrating to a much larger area, a much more supported system, something we knew was very reliable, very, um, you know, 
vetted through as far as reliability for students and tools for students and using it for instruction. So, you know, we're not out here on an island by ourselves, which is kind of the way we found with that third party. And obviously we know with online learning at a higher realm than it's ever been, the tool that we're using is more important than it's ever been, right? We're not just at the point where we can just share files with people, right? If we're running an online course or we have components that are going to be asynchronous within our learning, we know that those things need to be robust, they need to have variety and we need to be engaging our learners, right? So thankfully we have an LMS that allows us to do all of those things and put those things in front of our students, right? And really outside of our students, it's a great place for learning on top of that, right? Some of you are part, or I should say all of you are part of the new faculty orientation group, right? You might have some interest in creating a group for your advisees, which by the way, we're going to have a session on for you new teachers on how we do that. So outside of just having it for a course, there's also other uses, uses for Canvas across the system, right? Our uh, adjunct faculty, all of our adjuncts belong to a course, and that's kind of the way their onboarding is done. We have things that the university pushes out as far as security um, and phishing and malware and some of those courses we need to take to be abrupt on our uh, technology world. So some of that stuff comes through Canvas. So it's not just courses. It's a lot of other kind of learning environments is a way to kind of look at it. Okay. Um, believe it or not, even though we are here for um, a Canvas session, I want to start outside of Canvas today on your my Widener page, right? Because this is our Google search for Widener, anything we need, right? So I can be on my Widener website and click on my Woo links and get to my Widener. I can also be on my Widener website and click and get right to Canvas, right? So it takes you to the same exact place. It's just, we have multiple doors, right? Think about it as your house, right? You can go in the front door, you can go in the back door, you can go in the side door. You're still going inside the house. We're just getting there a different way. All right, and you'll find that with a lot of our tools, a lot of our links across campus kind of exist in multiple places. It's not that one works better than the other. It's just some people like it that way, or you might be working in that space. So the link is convenient there, but you know, we're all going to the same place in that sense. But the reason I wanted to start here on my Widener is because when you are signed in to my Widener, and you'll see that you have the option underneath your favorites bar to link your Canvas dashboard. OK, if you haven't done this yet on my Widener, you'll be asked for permission the first time and you're saying, sure, my Widener, go ahead, talk to campus. Great job. And you're giving permission as the user in order for that to happen. And then what you get here is a display of the courses that you have favorited on your Canvas homepage. Right. So, yes, you can click to Canvas and you can click into that course. But what you do is you save yourself a click. Right. So instead of going to the Canvas dashboard and clicking on the tile to go there, I can go to my Widener, click right on my informatics section, and it will shoot me right into that class, right, rather than having to go to the dashboard. So again, same place, just going in a different door. But I wanted to bring that to your attention because not only do we have everything else that you would need here for your my Widener stuff, you also have kind of this portal to get to the Canvas side here, okay? Um, if you're not familiar, please, on my Widener, the things that you use most frequently, like me, myself as an employee, I'm interested in human resources and seeing my paycheck and going to nursing office. Put a star in the bottom right-hand corner of those tiles, and they will always stay on your dashboard, okay? And then you never have to search for human resources again. You never have to search for payroll. If you're advising, put your advising tile there. You never have to search for advising again. Okay, that way that stuff is right in front of you. No star for the Canvas favorites. Again, the things that show up here in your Canvas favorites are the things that you have favorited on your Canvas dashboard. Now for you, as kind of new instructors, you this dashboard probably isn't too crazy yet. Believe me, you'll get there, right? But if you get into the realm in a little bit and you're a course coordinator, or you're handling multiple sections of something. You'll kind of have all these spaces that exist, but you don't necessarily need to be in all the time, right? So Donna, for instance, is the course coordinator for our Intro to Nursing class 125 and our Intro to Juro class 202. So she has her own sections that she teaches, 
but there's also these other sections that even though she's the coordinator for, she's not the main instructor for. So all of those courses are going to be here on her Canvas dashboard. She doesn't necessarily need to see all of them. So how do we get rid of those, right? How do I not put them in front of me? For me, here are my informatics courses. My one, two, and three are all mine. But really, as the course coordinator for informatics, there's 10 sections. So you don't see all 10 sections here on the front. So how do we manage that? This is one of the first things I want to look here on your dashboard here for Canvas. So when we click on courses, right, we get all these ones here that, again, are just a re repeat of what's here on the dashboard. But then at the bottom, we get a menu of all courses. Now, not only is this important for you, this is very important for students because this is one of the biggest questions we get at the beginning of the semester. And you might not get it for your course, but you might get another student that comes to you and says, hey, you know, as an advisor, I can't find my English class or I can't find, you know, this clinical section. Am I registered for it? I can't find it. Why can I not see it in Canvas? Chances are they are registered for it, except the course is not published, right? So the instructor has not hit that button to turn the course on for students. Now, now that here the semester has started, all of our courses should be published. But it is one of the biggest things we kind of get in the beginning of the semester. I'm enrolled in the course. I signed up for it. How comes I can't see it in Canvas? It's just not published yet. So this column is very important here. We want to make sure we have yeses in our published column. Now, I want to bring your attention over to the far left-hand side where our stars are. Again, just like our stars on my Weiner, these are your stars on Canvas. So the course that is starred is the course that you see on your dashboard. So for instance, I was talking about my 302 courses. Here are my sections of 302, 30201, 30202, 30203. Those three have stars so that when I sign into Canvas, they are right in front of me. The other ones that are running here in fall, 04, 05, and all the way up to 010, have other instructors. Can I still get into them if I need to? Absolutely, I can. I come to this page and I click on the link and I go into them. I'm still a teacher in that environment. I'm still enrolled. It's still there. It's just not right in front of me. All I would have to do to do is star that so that it is right in front of me. So again, not necessarily hugely important at this point, being kind of new on campus, just getting enrolled in some courses. But as you see, some of these things start to kind of accumulate over the semesters. And certainly if you start making some of your own shells or you start making your own advisee courses, you don't necessarily want that dashboard to be over cluttered, right? So just for viewing purposes. Now, again, if the clutter doesn't bother you, that's perfectly fine. Keep them all up there. But I just wanted to show you a different way to kind of manage that content in front of you. The same way, if you're working on something important, you might put it in your on your desktop so that it's right in front of you as opposed to your documents folder, right? It just brings your attention to it. So same thing we can manage here as far as the way our courses are displaying. Now here inside of all courses, you have the things that are here kind of running currently. And then you'll always have questions of, oh, I wanna go back to that course. I wanna see what I did in that semester. I wanna see what the grades were. You have to scroll down on the page and you get this past enrollment section, right? So all of your courses kind of have this date to it, what semester they run in, when they run. And then once that course concludes, it shoots down to that past enrollment section so that we can see there. Everything in that past enrollment session, section is, um, can be, how can I say that? Everything in the past enrollment section can still be seen, can still be accessed. The only thing we can't do is we can't change roles. And that's always a question we have with new faculty, right? It's, hey, I'm brand new teaching to this course. Can you put me in the, the last time the course ran so that I can see what materials were in it? And we love to be able to do that for you. But if the course is already concluded, we can't go in and then add you to a concluded course, right? And that's for accreditation purposes. Because when we go back and we look five years from now and we say, oh, who ran that course? Or someone comes up and has a problem with the course, has a problem with the grade, we need an accurate reflection of the faculty that were in that course at that time. So we can't all of a sudden just be adding faculty to courses that have already concluded because then we have to start weeding through, well, who actually taught the course? Because now I have eight faculty in a course from last fall because they all wanted to see the content. 
So if you do need a new kind of space to see some of that old content, all we do is we create a blank shell and then we just import that old content rather than putting you directly in the course that has already concluded. So we kind of have a back end way to get you that stuff. So please, if there is something that you're, that you're new to teaching in fall, or certainly as we get here to uh, upcoming to spring, depending on what your workload is, there's something new that you want to see, just reach out. We can always create a blank shell and we can put that content from the prior semester in that course so that you can have a good idea of what's working in there. All right. And that goes for anything, right? If you're working in a course and you're like, you know, I just want a place to play. So we call that our playground or our sandbox, right? You just want a place to mess around. You just want a place to screw with the discussion board or make modules or see how something works inside of there. That's no problem. We just create a blank shell, right? Because we don't necessarily want to have those working environments inside of a class. All of a sudden you publish something, you get six emails from students. Hey, what's this? I didn't know we were supposed to do it. And now you got more work for yourself. So anytime we kind of want that tinkering time or kind of mess around time, we just kind of make this, whatever you want to call it, master class, blank shell, sandbox, playground. <laughs> Everyone's got their own term for it, but we're certainly capable and we can, we're certainly willing to do those things for you. Okay. Um, let me jump out of the courses page and go back to my favorite button here on canvases is 1821 at the top. It takes you right back to the dashboard, right? It doesn't say home or anything. You wouldn't know it's a link, but that 1821 does take you right back to the dashboard. So that's a great place to go. Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, when you click on that courses, that star you said is actually meant for putting it on the dashboard. So beside that star, I find certain rectangles which are colored. So what does that really mean, the colored rectangles? That's a great question, Panny. That is just the color code that goes along with the course, right? Because again, Canvas is just trying to, I think, like reach can you, all... click, can you click on courses on your dashboard? On your For sure. Yeah. You're talking about this here? Yeah, yeah I'm talking about this. Right. So this color is feeding off of the color that you set on the tile on the front. So when you click on the three dots of the course, you can change the color of that tile, okay. right? Again, for workload purposes, you're like, oh, I'm working in this class. Uh, what, what class is that? I know it's purple. Oh, it's gonna be purple on that list too, right? So all they're doing is they're kind of giving you another way to match that content. And same thing for me, I always go in and I make these my own. I don't necessarily refer to it as the orange class, but I think it's just more aesthetically pleasing when you go in and you look at your course and you just have a variety of things. So that's just a user preference, Banny, but good question there. Um, that's actually where I was going next. You have the ability to color code these tiles to whatever you want. You also have the ability to move and drop them wherever you want. So if you want something first, you want something second, whatever that might be, you're just holding and dragging the same way you would move things on the desktop on your computer. And Another if, really good buddy. If you want to delete a course from that course schedule, how do you delete that? If you just want to get rid of it off of this front page, you just unstar it on your courses list. No, I want to delete it totally. Let's say you go on the courses list, please. There is no delete it totally. Oh, okay. Okay. Once it's there, it's there. On the admin side, we do have the ability to kind of get rid of things, but um, there there is no kind of I just want to delete this from the Canvas universe. Okay. Can you think of a use where you might want that? No, like because it's my own Canvas page, so I should be able to delete or insert a post. Isn't it quite right? Like it's not an overall everybody's page. It's a, my personal page on Canva. So I should be having the ability to delete a post if I want. Yes, in, in, in a great world, that would be the case, but you do not have the ability as the instructor to do that. Okay. Um, you don't have the ability to create a course either. Those things have to be requested um, because what you have here is you have the entire university using the same system. So okay. if in, in the event of not being able to find it or an admin trying to be able to find it, they kind of took the reins back on those things. And they said, you know, the admins are allowed to create 
and delete courses. And me as an admin in nursing, I can't even create and delete. I have to reach out to TLT for someone to even create and delete. So that's kind of this whole new territory um, of things. But the best way to do that, if you're trying to manage that front page, is just to unstar it so that it just kind of sleeps in that list by itself. Thank you. No problem. Um, the other thing I wanted to bring your attention to here is obviously I talked about this being my informatics course. We're going to click here inside of the settings and the settings are the same for all of your courses. I would encourage you to set the picture for that course. Okay. There are default pictures that are in there. For me, I took the picture off the front of the textbook, right? So the students associate this book with this class, with this textbook, and they all see it in one place. If there's some kind of image that represents your course well or the content well that you would like to represent on the front there, that's perfectly fine. Choose that image and put it in your course. But then that way, it's not just a blank tile for the students. Again, just a way to kind of bring the, the mind around to assimilation and seeing all of that in one place. Um, you'll see that here, for example, on the SON adjunct orientation. All we did was create that on a Word document and take a picture and then import that picture so that the picture says SON adjunct orientation. So if that's something you're looking for, you can create whatever image or whatever text you want in a Word document, take a screenshot of it so you have a picture of it, and then just use that as a picture in your Canvas course. So really the possibilities are immense here. It's just kind of what you're looking for and whatever you think would work best for you but a lot of things we could do there that kind of make it our own. Um, here's my advising course, right? I just took a picture of, I just took this off of Google Images, advice, tips, assistance, guidance, support, help, right? That's what you do as an advisor. So just find an advising image to put up there. I could easily type out Dr. Bobel's advisees, take a picture and import it so that that's what it says on the tile. So again, that's up to you, whatever you would like to put there. But I would encourage you to put something. Otherwise, it's just kind of this color, right? It's not anything. Um, so it's not that that's wrong. It's just as a learner, I would think, right, I would want to assimilate my class with some kind of image or something that's important to that course, something that makes it go, aha, and pops off the page. And an image can certainly do that for you. Okay. Let me jump back into the settings of a course. Um, and I want to kind of take a look here at some of the other things you can do besides the image, right? You'll notice that we have different ways to name things. On your side, these fields are not editable because you're just at an instructor level. But what I'm showing this for is if you are creating a shell or some, some kind of advisee course or something, we have the ability to go in and rename those things or edit content or anything that we need to do there to better reflect that change. Okay, so, so we can go in and, and change those things. One of the other big features we find is that sometimes students or you want students to have access to a course outside of the course period, right? So here, this course started on the 23rd, which was yesterday, which means students could only get to the learning content as of that point. But Donna is a great example of this because we have some courses for our accelerated group that kind of run on a very short schedule over holidays, right? We have one that runs over our Christmas break. We have another one that runs over the first, you know, the second to last week in August so that they can get that in. So it doesn't necessarily line up with a course period. It doesn't line up with fall. It doesn't line up for spring, but it is going to have the fall and spring dates. So as the instructor, we have the ability to go in and change this to a regular course and say, okay, I want this course to be available from this date to this date, right? Not necessarily the length of the period of the fall semester or the length of the period of a summer semester, but maybe just for a week, maybe just for two weeks, okay? Maybe for a different time period. If you're teaching in Harrisburg, our semesters are different. So those dates kind of don't always line up with what the system has so that's another good feature in there. Uh, the other thing I wanna bring your attention to is the grading scheme. I mentioned this inside of our, um, <clears throat> excuse me, inside of our tech talk. A couple different grading schemes across campus. 
excuse me, and our nursing grading scheme does not use the university grading scheme. It does. So it's so close, but it just doesn't cut the bill. Really, the biggest change is when you get down to the C's. Um, their C goes further than the baseline of 75. And inside of nursing, our cutoff for a C and passing is 75. So I think the university goes to like a 73 or whatever. So if it's at that university level and the student is registering a 74 inside of their grade book, it will still say that they have a C. But in our nursing curriculum, they do not have a C. They have a C minus, right? So that's why we need to make sure that we're on our correct nursing grading scheme so that those numbers are displaying accurately. You as the instructor have to still go in and put the grades in at the end of the semester. So chances are you'll probably catch it, right? You'll see a number, it'll say 73, but the student in, in their seat is thinking this whole time that they've passed the course, right? Because their grading scheme is showing that their 73 is a C and that's not necessarily the case. So unfortunately we've had had students where we kind of have to, not necessarily be the bearer of bad news because they should realize that their number is less than 73, but it's just not, or less than 75. It's just not accurately being represented in the system because of the grading scheme that's selected. So rather than breaking hearts at the end of the semester and drying tears, we try to make sure that those things are in order in the beginning. So there are no surprises um, about grades when it comes to the end. So that's always something uh, to check on the end there. Okay. Um, I'm going to hop out of settings there. Does anybody have any other questions about settings? I, I have a question. Sure, go ahead. Um, does this undergraduate grading scheme also apply to the graduate courses? Because my course is listed using a scheme called Widener Sun and uh, or School of Nursing, and it's slightly different. And I just wonder if I need to change it. I'm That's a to. really good question. Um, I, I live like 15% in the grad world, Donna. If I could figure out what screen that I have to click on here. Um, the, the, grad, uh, the grad grading should be the same, I think, as the regular university grading. It's not the same as the undergrad. So what does your say um, for a C? Um, it says uh, less than 77%. It matches what was on the syllabus that I was given. Okay, um, so let's go with that. Okay. Yeah, it has to match the syllabus, but yeah. it is. It's different than the undergrad. Yeah, is that undergrad, undergrad thresholds the seventy-five. All right. You see, well, it's saying that a C is a seventy-seven, or a C minus is a seventy. I mean, what's different on it than this? Um, oh, C minus is 73. Right. So that's the traditional. That's yeah, that's the traditional. Okay. The only thing that's different with the undergrad is that C, the yeah. bar is at a 75. So we pulled it from a 73 to a 75 for a C for a, an undergrad to pass. That's the only thing that's different between the two. Okay, great. Um, thank you. I just didn't know if I needed to change it, but I'll, I'll leave no, it No, perfect. Is. That's a great question. Yes, it is. And thank you for the clarification, Donna. I appreciate that. Um, okay. Uh, outside of settings in a course, I'm going to bring us back here to uh, the front homepage because we have a couple other things that can be set particularly or particular to you, right? What do you prefer? All right. Um, so I'm going to jump here inside of your account settings in Canvas, and that would be kind of that circle right underneath the 1821. If you haven't put your picture in there yet, it's probably just a gray silhouette. I would encourage you to upload an image there um, that was covered inside of the Tech Talk, or I will show you how to do that real quickly here by just clicking on account, clicking on profile, and then hovering over top of your mug, and you can see the pencil to be able to edit that. So you can pull that image from anywhere. Um, again, it would be nice if those things 
talked across campus, but that's not the case. Uh, we kind of have to set those in everywhere that we are. And look, I noticed that my title is wrong here. I haven't been inside of here. Um, I also want to bring your attention to what I'm doing right now, which is your profile, right? If a student clicks on your name, this is what they see. Uh, not only uh, especially important for new faculty, but also very important for online classes, right? We kind of want to build that online connection the same way that a student would feel inside of that comforting face-to-face -face environment. So giving them contact information, showing them a picture of yourself, having an introduction message board describing you and what you like to do and your family and things like that, you know, make them feel like they know you on an even more personal level and allow that for that encouraging, encouraging engagement to occur to a higher degree. Okay, so we certainly want to make sure that we are editing our profile. This can be uh, similar to your, excuse me, your email signature, right? You can just copy and paste that stuff here. Has your email address, has your office number, how do we get a hold of you, um, your phone number. For me, I put my Zoom address in there. Um, so it's really whatever you prefer, but kind of your end all be all. Again, if they click on um, your stuff, they can see that there. And then of course, if you have any other links, right? If you have an outside website or you wanna give them access to your LinkedIn profile or send them to your, your university profile, whatever that could be, you can always add links there as well. Um, there are, I have seen people use that as kind of the links thing as like a catch all for benchmarks or for bookmarks, right? Uh, we know that there's a massive amount of links to handle and you could say, uh, you know, here are all these links to go to as a learner or brush up on this content or visit this resource. You can always put that stuff right in your profile um, as well, kind of easy access for those things. Um, let's see here, it doesn't let me edit that part. I'm still an instructional technologist up there, that's okay. The other thing I wanted to bring your attention to in here, which is a absolutely massive system, is the notification settings for your particular account, all right? Now, these can be customized and developed in way more ways, I think, than anybody would ever really want as an instructor, um, but it's really up to you. It is really nice as a student because you can get a notification when something's graded. You know, you get a notification when an instructor changes an assignment. You get a notification when um, the due date is coming up. So you can really set a lot of notifications in here, not only for your email, but you can also add um, your regular, excuse me, your other devices as far as, uh, you know, your cell phone or another email device or anything that might be. So you can get those push notifications anywhere. Okay, so that's always something to take a look at and kind of venture into a little bit there. Um, let me see if there is, yeah, I'm going to go into all of that right now. All right, here we are back on the dashboard. We took a look at linking the courses on my Widener and setting up that authorization. We just took a look at your profile and setting up notifications inside of um, the system. We also took a look at settings inside of an actual course, right? What do those settings look like? How do we set the picture for it? How do we set the color for it? So kind of some very basic stuff, okay? The next place I wanna go is actually looking at a course itself and the components that exist inside of a learning environment, okay? Now, this is where we're gonna spend a little bit of time, but we're gonna spend a lot more time inside of our Canvas Plus, right? Because we can sit here and talk about a whole bunch of ways, excuse me, for Studio to be used, a whole bunch of different ways for your discussion boards to be used, different ways to link in modules, different ways to link in assignments, but all of that would take way more than the uh, about, you know, 26 minutes that I have left with you here today. And really about 16, because I want to give the last 10 minutes for open dialogue and chat. So I just want to kind of brush the surface here about some of these things. I think the majority of these are self-explanatory, right? When you look at this, and you look at something called people, you know that when you click on people in the course, it's going to show you the people in the course, right? So 
that's pretty straightforward. Some of the things that we get a little bit of, well, why is it like that questions on is your first link here, which is home. Okay. What Canvas lets you do is it lets you set the home page of your course to anything, right? So as a student, when I click on the course, where do I land? You can have the students land inside of assignments. You can have the students land inside of modules. You could even have them click on the course and it opens right to the gradebook. Okay. Not really useful, any of those. What we needed was we needed kind of a blank place, right? We needed a space where we could put the title of the course, we could put the instructor, we could put where the course met, we could put some links, we could put a video, we could type out whatever we needed. We needed a blank slate. Now, inside of Canvas, where does that blank slate exist? It exists on a page they call syllabus. Okay, now, if you're brand new, that's confusing as all heck. You think syllabus, well, that's what I give the students. That's the document I hand them that outlines the course, has all of our objectives, has all the content information. They're just using the word in a different way. So what we did here is we made every course inside of Widener, their home page is the syllabus page. Okay, so when you click on home, you go to syllabus. The students, if you can see the eyeball here that's crossed out, don't even see this word syllabus because it would be very confusing for them. Because same thing as you, when they think syllabus, they think a document. They think a Word document, a PDF, a downloadable document. And that's not what this is. This is a page that just lets us type on it, okay? So that's why we have our syllabus page as our home page. So when we click on home, here's our blank slate. And then to even twist it up a little bit more, here's a link to my syllabus on my homepage, which is really my syllabus. So chew on that for a second, right? All I did was I took a link to my document, which is technically my syllabus, and I put it on my homepage, right? And I encourage you to do that same exact thing, right? It's a Word document, it's a PDF, it's whatever it is. Come and take that piece of information, Put it inside of files in the course. Your files are the same thing as your computer files. You're uploading something the same way you would in OneDrive. So I upload my file here. And then that way, that file can be put inside of the course. In this case, it's my syllabus being put on the front page of my course. Okay. You'll also notice that we have this same setup for everyone. Okay, this instructor line, time, location, credits, course syllabus, course description, excuse me. And then you're welcome to put anything else that you want on here that's pertinent for your class. For me, where do you get the textbook? Here's a link to Amazon. Another thing we're doing, important dates for resume and cover letters. I want to put that right in front of them. So I put it right there. We're going to meet on Zoom. I put the Zoom address right in front of them. All right, so these are the things we encourage you to do to put on the front page so that you alleviate the 14 emails that come with, hey, how do I get into class? Hey, where do I find the book? Because we know you're going to get those emails. So the more you kind of put those key items in front of them, hopefully the less clutter of your email you have to catch up on at another time. Okay, so in order to do that, this is just an edit up top here. I'm just clicking edit. I can type on this page any way I want to. I call this your HTML window. You have all of your tools here as far as bolding, underlining, changing the color of the text, inserting pictures, inserting links, inserting documents, all of those things. The document's very important because that's how you pull that syllabus in, right? When you click on this piece of paper, all I'm doing is clicking on course documents. It brings up another window. I say, I want that syllabus. Watch, when I click on that syllabus, it drops it right on the page for you, all right? So same way as if you're typing in a window and you say, please read this article. And instead of giving them the title of the article, you can drop the link to the article right there in the window. So it's not, 
Dr. Rockman, I can't find the article. Where is it? Or I searched on Google. I find four copies. Which one should I be reading? Put that link right in the window and they can get it right there. You don't have to answer those little questions because you're putting it right in front of them, right? So we can do those things for you. Let me come out of there real quick. Another great point here is the intro video. I'm not gonna spend a whole bunch of time on this, but we are really big components of the video instruction, right? Especially those things that you feel like students might need a little bit more help on. You know, as an instructor, what topics are extremely difficult. You know, as an instructor, you're going into week seven and you're like, man, you know, this is the week we're, you know, we're gonna talk about whatever it might be. I'm not a nurse, so I'm not even going to make something up. But you know that that's going to be a hard topic for them. That's a great place to make some supplemental learning for them. That's a great place to make an extra video for them or explain something in a different way or go find another resource on ATI or link to a, a YouTube video. We know as a learner that sometimes for that aha moment to occur, it just maybe needs to be explained in a different way. Maybe we just need to hear it more than one time. So putting those things in front of them and allowing students to do those things in their own time can only benefit them, right? We don't necessarily want to drown them with it. We don't want to give them a whole page full of links. We want it to be meaningful, but we also want it to be something that's easy for them, right? So like we talked about, our perfect LMS here, right? The Canvas LMS gives us the ability to kind of link these things and put them anywhere that you would need to, okay? What I was referring to a little bit here with the videos is a component that we call our, I like to refer to it as the Canvas YouTube, right? This is the video component inside of Canvas. They call it studio. This is a place where you can screen capture, you share your screen, you share your PowerPoint, you lecture, you share a YouTube video and talk over it, whatever that might be, all exists in, inside of studio. On top of that, those studio videos can have quizzes embedded on top of them. So as you're lecturing, the video will stop and ask the students a multiple choice question or a fill in the blank question. They answer the, that question, those results go right into the quiz and go right into the grade book. You're getting automatic feedback and automatic understanding of what the students are getting from that video, from that learning content in real time. Okay, I'm not gonna spend a bunch of time for you. That's my hook to get you to come to my session in two weeks to my Canvas or to my Canvas Plus where we look a little bit more at Studio and that tool, all right? The other thing I wanna bring your attention to inside of your tools here are some of the other main components outside of just the homepage, right? We are very big pushes for attendance, right? Not only did this attendance help you understand who's been in class and who might miss, this also feeds into our student retention system at the university level. So if a student is struggling or not being successful in what they're doing, the first thing one of those student retention specialists is going to do is they're going to go look at their attendance from the course, right? Now, some of our grad students, probably not necessarily important, you're not doing this all the time, but some of our lower level classes, some of our freshman and sophomore students that are just getting started, where we know that there's a, there's a higher probability of them not being successful because they're younger university students. That's the place where those attendance records really come into fruition. So we definitely want to make sure we're taking attendance. You can tell that, wow, this class has done a really good job of getting some of these pictures in here and having these here, these really aid in kind of taking attendance in those face-to-face -face settings. For some of the larger groups, this can be kind of time consuming of going through and taking attendance. So we would encourage you to gather attendance using a QR code, right? Allow students to, to scan the QR code, fill out a form, type in their name, type in their section, and then you as the instructor go back and look at the results of that form. And then you can come in and take attendance at another time, right? Because otherwise you're taking the first five, six minutes of class looking through people, trying to find who they are. Now, if you have a group of 20, that's all good. I encourage you to take attendance out loud. I encourage you to take attendance by calling on students. Andre, what's our answer? Or Andre, what would you do in that question? If Andre doesn't answer, he's not there. So you know that you can mark him absent for that day. I would encourage you to take attendance through the Socratic method that way. 
But if you have a large group, we do push you towards kind of using a little, little bit more of electronic approach so that you are not taking up that class time to take attendance. If you have questions about creating a QR code or creating an attendance form, no problem. I'm here for you to help do that. Just reach out. I will be happy to point you in the right direction and happy to get you started on that resource. Okay, pretty easy, pretty straightforward outside of that. So that's our attendance. You'll see that we can just rotate by day. So, excuse me, you'll find that if you go in to take an attendance on that electronic form and say you don't go in and do it till the day after, just make sure you go back to the actual day that the class occurred to take the attendance on, right? If it's a Monday, Wednesday, Friday class, you don't wanna be on the Tuesday page recording attendance because then all of a sudden it's like, well, why was he in class on Tuesday? We didn't have class on Tuesday. So if you're doing it after the fact, just make sure you're navigating to the correct day on top that defaults to the current day. So if you're doing it backtrack, just make sure you go there. Attendance, making our way down, we're going to grades. Your grade is your grade book. You can come in and actually click on the box inside of the grade book and type in the grade for a user and record that way. If it is a written assignment or someone is submitting something, I would encourage you to use the tool inside of Canvas called Speed Grader that allows you to bring up the document that the student has submitted to you, allows you to annotate and notate on top of it. And then it also gives you a little box on the right hand side to type in the grade that will go right into the grade book. So rather than, oh, I read this paper. OK, let me go to the grade book, enter the grade. Let me go back to the paper, back to the grade back, and got it so much. Perfect tool called Speed Grader. Let me show it to you real quick so you know how to get to it. I can't show you in a class right now because I don't have anything up for submission, but I can go to a class that ran over the summer where we had people submit things. Oh, 302, there it is, perfect. I couldn't be luckier if I tried. Assignments. Okay, here I had my electronic health record systems review. This is the assignment. This is what students see, right? The students see what it's called. They see what they have to do, what they have to look at, and then they have to upload something. I see eight out of eight submissions have been graded. This is for me as the instructor. When I click on their tool called Speed Grader, this takes me to what they've submitted. So here's Erica's paper that was submitted. I can go through and look at Erica's paper and use the tools along the top to write or highlight anything that I need to do. I also have the ability to comment on the right hand side. And then there's my box to put in the grade. Okay. So when I put in the grade here, it talks to the grade book. I go to the next student. Now I go, I look at Madeline's paper I make my comment. I put in my grade. I go to the next student. Okay. So this is kind of like the grade book on steroids, right? Not only do you get to put in the actual grade itself, but you see the submission, you're able to comment, you're able to highlight, you're able to underline all those things. You can even reassign, right? You can say, this is not acceptable, or this could be better. Please do this over. And this allows you to reassign. That gives them the ability to just re-upload again and submit a different paper to you. So you have all of that ability kind of in this space. A nuance to this system is that in the grade book, when you type this number, it saves automatically. And if they have a notification to get their grades when it's put in, they're getting that notification right away. So if you look and you're like, okay, I'm giving this person a 95, Nicolette got a notification that her paper was graded and she got a 95. Now, if for some reason you go and look at someone else's paper and you're like, well, this was a 95, I probably should not do Nicolette's at a 95 and you go back and change it. She's going to get another notification that the grade was changed, right? So what we want to be careful of is if you're intending on doing the whole group inside of your grade book here, you have the ability to come up for a given assignment and hide grades, right? And that just turns it off for everybody. And then when everything is graded, you're sure everything is the way you want it to be, you're ready to release grades to everybody, you just come in and you post grades. 
And now everyone gets their grade at the same time. Everyone can see everything at the same time. So it's really your preference as the instructor. Um, those things are in, in there for you. All right, let me jump back into my actual course real quick. The one thing I want to spend a little bit other time on outside of your, excuse me, your kind of mainstays here is this Zoom link. Okay, the Zoom link inside of your course is giving your students a Zoom entrance to your Zoom room. Okay, so if you are scheduling a whole class meeting, go in here and click on Zoom and schedule the meeting. Okay, the students will get a notification that you have scheduled a meeting for that class. If you are scheduling a meeting for a colleague and you want to meet with Donna or you want to meet with Banny, you're going to widener.zoom.us or your Zoom application on your computer and scheduling a meeting. Okay, it's important to remember that the Zoom inside of Canvas is only for that course. Okay, so the meetings that you're setting up, the recordings you're distributing are only going to the stakeholders in that environment. Anything else you're doing in Zoom, any other meetings you want to set up, you need to do that in your actual Zoom account. All right, we just have a little confusion on that sometimes. Um, the other thing I want to bring your attention to is the Office 365. Similar to Zoom, it's just a portal to your Office 365 items. Okay. It is not giving the students the ability to see your Office 365. It's just giving you the ability to access it here in the window. So rather than opening a whole nother tab and going to OneDrive, I just have the ability to see those things inside of here. It's wanting me to log in. It sees my login. It works for a second. Okay. So if I want to go in and download something from my OneDrive, or make it available inside of here. I just have the ability to kind of get in here through that portal. Okay. I can't say we have a whole lot of use of that. Um, our another great thing in here is a lockdown browser. A lot of you are using ExamSoft for your testing, but this is another testing service that we have here. It works with Canvas and it locks down the student's browser while they're testing. So they're not able to go to Google. They're not able to go to outside websites while they're inside of the testing tool. So that's something else to look at. Um, we'll have another session uh, later on after some of these intro sessions that look into some of these specific tools inside of Canvas. I want to pause there um, because that is everything I had on my list. And I've now talked for a straight 52 minutes. Do you have any questions or anything I can address specifically here in the next couple minutes before uh, we go our separate ways? Uh, hi, Andrew. I have a couple of points. Go ahead, Benny. Uh, I know it's a lot of material that you have provided. Uh, everything I could not digest, but is there any sort of uh, widener training material that is there which really speaks in depth about what you have said in one hour? Like, like how to upload a file and all those things. Just I'm trying to, like if I have any questions, instead of asking every time, can I go to that training material and can see it? Yes, for sure. The, the trouble is, is there's, there's not really a one-stop shop of everything I just discussed because I kind of, I'm, I'm in a whole bunch of different places. Mm -hmm. So first step is this is recorded, right? So you can always go back and look at this again. I will make this recording available to everyone and it will always be on our YouTube channel. So you can always go back and look. Um, the second thing is there is a kind of intro to Canvas course that we have that will go over gradebook, go over using speed grader, mm -hmm. look at how to edit the homepage. That's perfectly fine. In order for you to get to that, you just come down here and click on help. Mm -hmm. And you can go to the training services portal, right? We also have a place in Canvas called the commons. And that's kind of like the Canvas community. That's where other people put other materials out and Canvas kind of puts out their training materials. So the how to's or this is the way I did this or kind of those things. And like we said in the beginning, Google is always your friend as well. But Banny, I encourage you, any question you have to please reach out to me. I am here for you. Don't feel like you're being a bother. <laughs> okay, the quick next question, the last question. Sure. Uh, I saw on your... Oh, no. 
Okay, so on your home page. There is something called uploading the file. So let's say uh, let's say you are on the course, like you are teaching a course, and on the home page you have the syllabus uploaded. So as you said, I uploaded my syllabus in the file section. So I have the syllabus uploaded in the file, but I want to get that link from that file section to what you showed, like you have that um, syllabus embedded as a link in your yes. home page. So how Absolutely. So here I am on the home page. I'll delete what I have right now. So I'll show you how to put it anew. Okay. Okay. So the only thing we have to do here is in our top bar, we come over to the paper icon. Okay. And we click on course documents. Those okay. course documents are, is everything you have inside of files. Okay. All right. So when I click on that, here's my syllabus at the top of the list, because that's the last thing I uploaded. All mm -hmm. I do is click on it one more time and it drops it right on that page where my cursor was. Yeah. It's that simple. It's that simple. Yeah. And that goes the same thing for, for any other file, right? If you have a PDF you want students to refer to, a rubric you want them to look at, an article you want them to read, you can link those things inside of any window on Canvas as long as they exist in your files. Right. And you can actually kill two birds with one stone. Say you have an article on your desktop, you can then uh, go to... I guess, can you still use the, the course icon or do you have to go to insert? And no, you, I always, you could still use the course icon because okay, instead you would just do upload. Upload documents and then you find where you have it. Oh. If it's on your desktop or in a file or in your OneDrive or wherever. And, and, and I have an observation, like we are discussing about the grading scheme, different for undergraduate and graduate. So because I'm teaching a graduate course, so when I look at that on my screen, I see the graduate grading scheme. But if somebody is teaching an undergraduate course, if he clicks on that grading scheme, it will show as undergraduate grading scheme. So it depends on the course which you are, which is there. So based on that, it will show the grading scheme. Correct. So that's my observation. I thought like, you don't have to really find out whether it is for undergraduate or graduate. Based on the course, it will show you the grading scheme. That's a good observation, Benny. Thank you. Yeah. Anything yeah. else? Uh, at a later point of time, uh, Andrew, I need to create my Zoom account. So uh, maybe later on when you are available, uh, you need to a little bit help me. That's no problem, Banny. If you could uh, just shoot me a quick email, I will send you very fast instructions on how to do that. Okay, thank you so much. Thank no you. problem. Absolutely. Anything else I can answer or help with at this time? And that Zoom account is really different from setting up a Zoom discussion with the students, right? Correct. Well, they're, they're using the same account, but the, the, the Zoom discussion with the students linking through Canvas will only be available to that group of students, as opposed to you creating a Zoom account, which I'm going to give you instructions for, gives mm -hmm. you a wider Zoom account that you can talk to your colleagues with, talk to Donna with, talk to Rose with talk to someone at another university with, it's your Zoom address. You do what you would like with it. But even that Zoom address should be able to address the students. Like if I put the students' names over there, I should be able to talk on that common Zoom account with even the students. Yes. Yes, we do have people use it that way. The, the, um, the plus side to the link in in the Canvas side is that when you schedule the meeting, the students get it automatically on their calendar and a notification that the meeting has been scheduled, as opposed to just saying, 
here's the link. Make sure you click on it when you're supposed to. You can go in and say, I have class on this date from six to nine and the Zoom link, and that will show on their calendar when you create it through the Canvas Zoom side. Does that make sense? Yeah, I understand. Okay. And Andrew, I personalize my Zoom link. So if I were to create that and put it on the calendar for students, is that the same link in my account? So if they decide to go through a different way, with the personalized one versus the one I schedule, Yes, it just depends on whether you choose for your meeting to use your personal meeting ID, which would be your personalized one, or the other option for the extra level of security is the random generation, which wow. just gives you a nine digit number that's particular to that Zoom Got meeting. Okay. Yeah, so just it depends on what setting you hit when you're scheduled when you're actually scheduling. Uh, I'll do a quick last question. I'm having a lot of questions for you. Sorry about that. That's fine, Penny. That's what I'm here for. What you want to, let's say I want to upload some lecture materials for my students. So which is the right area and where should I do it? If you just a lecture, just a PowerPoint? Yeah, PowerPoint or some Word documents. And yeah, you're just putting just putting it in files. Oh, I have to put it in files? Yes, and then and then once it's in files, you can put it anywhere. Right. So if you then say, OK, here's the assignment, week one assignment, I need you to read da, 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 da. Then you can link those things in files on the actual assignment, but they have to start in files so that we can distribute them where we want to actually put them within the course. So how to let the students know that they need to do the assignment or quiz? Is it the announcement section? Um, you can put it in there or you, you're putting a due date on there. And when they click on the course, they see when it's due and, it, and it's on them to, to complete by that time. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. No problem. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Andrew, because I learned something every